everyone uh, for being with us this evening for the kickoff first event of our Voices of Healing series. It comes to you from the IU Interprofessional Practice and Education Centre and it's my absolute pleasure to hand you over to Ted so he can share some of his um, incredible wisdom with you this evening. Thanks. So, over to you, Ted. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for being here. So, I have a, well, start since it's genetic illness week, I have a genetic illness. I have Gaucher's disease, which is a lysostomal storage disorder. I had my spleen out when I was a little kid. I spent a good portion of my childhood in and out of a hospital. I missed school. So that's sort of my upbringing. I was, I was a really sick kid, and luckily, NIH, using money from all you taxpayers, uh, came up with a treatment for it when I was in my mid-40s. So because of that, I am here today to give you this lovely PowerPoint presentation. So my mom, uh, Gaucher's disease is mostly Ashkenazi Jews because of the ghettoization of the Jews. So my mom was Russian or uh, Lithuanian, we don't know, the borders constantly change. My dad was Polish uh, Jew, so I had, uh, both my parents were carriers of this illness, neither one of them knew it until we were born. My brother Richard and I both have it, and my brother Doug had none of it, luckily for him. And this is me when I was a kid, so I spent a lot of time in a wheelchair, a lot of time on crutches, this is me at the World's Fair, and as I was saying when we showed these before, this is how my dad always took pictures with half the people cut off. <laughs> I don't know how he managed to do that, but almost every photo from when I was a kid, somebody is cut off right in the middle. And this is my brother and I. So we both landed up getting our spleens removed. So in the old days, before there was treatment, which is enzyme replacement for the one we don't do, Fat cells would collect in your spleen, your spleen would rupture, so they would take your spleen out before that happened. So Richard and I had our spleens taken out at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York years and years ago. And as much as that kept us alive, as soon as you get your spleen taken out, all the things that were going wrong with the spleen go into the long bones. So you're, you start having bone crisis, bone infarctions, um, a lot of pain, and that's why I was in the hospital so much. It wasn't that it, I was going to die from it at that point, um, but the pain of having a bone crisis from this illness, is, it's pretty severe. So, uh, I was in a teaching hospital, and I just hated being in a teaching hospital, and that's what led to all the work I'm doing now, because I remember having uh, doctors come in in groups and they would tap on me and I had this huge distended stomach from having the large spleen or you know my bones were deteriorating and they would all tap me and they would talk about me and then they would all leave and they would never say anything to me like how are you feeling does this hurt I was really this object because at the time there were only a couple hundred known cases of Gaucher's disease now there's about 6,000 people on treatment worldwide, but back then there were only about 250. So I was this sort of freaky thing, and they would come in and talk about me and leave, and that always annoyed me. It always stayed with me, and then when I got older and started to feel better, I started to think, what can I do to change that dynamic of kids in the hospital, adults in the hospital who weren't being acknowledged as anything other than hormone levels and charts and graphs and things like that. Um, so I hated that, and I also hated doctors with no sense of humor. And because I, probably because I'm Jewish and we always tell jokes, but I would always tell jokes in the hospital and the doctors would sort of always just look at me and I never really understood that. So I will tell you my two favorite doctor jokes. So there was one when I had my hip replaced and uh, the weekend doctor came in and asked if, if I had spoken to my real doctor, and the doctor 
I said, yes. And he goes, what did he tell you? When, when are you going to be released? And I said, well, he said he had two more payments for his sailboat. <laughs> and, and the guy just looked at me and he goes, I didn't know uh, he had a sailboat. And he, he walked out. Like, that made perfect sense to him. And then my other, this is my absolute favorite. I had, I had sliced my hand open with a piece of glass. I went to the emergency room. The doctor pulled out all the glass. And he said, can you move your thumb? And I went, just like a chimpanzee. And he just looked at me. He goes, they don't have semi-opposable thumbs. And he walked out. He like just didn't. So anyway, that stuff bugs me. So, and so this is my dad, speaking of humor, writing in iodine on my stomach before my spleen being removed, cut here. He thought that would be very funny. To, I would show up in the operating room with dotted line. So the best part of being in the hospital, I always got cake when I got home. So that was good. This is me. Uh, I never had to go to gym class once ever my entire childhood. I'm, so I missed a lot of school. I learned really early about morphine because back then there was no drip. They just came in every four hours, shot you up with morphine. So I was like seven and eight experiencing this rush of morphine, which was unbelievable to me. And as a result, I, I've never even smoke pot because I, I would sit there in the hospital at eight years old going, where's my, where's my morphine? You know, it was something that I knew if I even experimented with it, I would not have the willpower. Uh, I also learned to enjoy life when I was healthy because I saw so many kids that were so much worse off than me, you know, in the hospital. So I think I got a pretty good education and, uh, and empathy, part of why I'm here, but also just learning that so many people had it worse than me. And this is one of the good things that happened. This, is, this was a picture from the front of the Daily News in New York. This is the Mets first baseman the year after they won the World Series, Ed Cranepool. And somehow my parents pulled the, we have a sick kid, come to the hospital and get your picture taken with him. <laughs> so this was like very, very exciting for me. To, and it was also, it was the only time ever when I went back to school after being sick, where kids were like, oh, we saw you in the Daily News. We wish we had your illness so we could see, meet Ed Creampool. Um, so this is me with my art supplies. And normally, I would go to the hospital. We'd pack up all my clothes. I would be in there for the, the bone crisis for about two weeks at a time, sometimes longer. And I would always bring my art supplies, and that's where I started sort of getting this idea of mixing art and medicine because of a woman who worked at the hospital. She, was, she happened to be uh, the mom of one of my friends. And she came in one day, and I was doing, I, I'd had a very bad day in the hospital. I, I really wanted to leave. And she said to me, you can draw the fact that you don't like it here. And she, it was her idea to take IV tubes and bandages and gauze and stick all these things on a paper and do a drawing with it. And she just kept coming in and going, you know, she was doing art therapy with me before there was art therapy. And it completely changed my life because it freed me up to emote that I hated it because my parents were very much buck up, <laughs> this is your situation deal with it. And she was the one who said, no, you can tell us that you don't like it. So that was really, really important for me. So for years, this is the kind of work I did. This, this was a piece that was in a portrait show. I was living in San Diego after college. And everybody was given a 9 by 12 piece of paper and told to do a portrait. And everybody else did sort of standard portraits. And I did this because my bones were deteriorating. I was in a lot of pain. I was doing graphics at the time, which was almost, well, pre-computer graphics was really difficult because you had to do everything manually. And I was so fatigued from the illness and the fact that I had no uh, bone marrow because of the, the gauchets that I was really anemic. I was exhausted all the time. So this is how I felt. and. Um, yeah, that's it. I was, and I was not very nice back then. 
if you had met me back then, you would have said, this guy is really crappy. <laughs> because I was just angry all the time. And I was exhausted. I was just so exhausted all the time, I like, could not be my normal, happy, cheerful self. Um, so a few years after that, I did these. This is right before I went in and had my first set of hip replacements. I've had them done twice. And um, I, w I was just weighing everything that goes into making that decision. This is um, the cost. The medicine's a quarter million dollars a year. And my own value as a person was I worth three policemen or four teachers or whatever that quarter million a year was. And a lot of people that have my illness, that's a big concern for us. Like uh, our personal value of a medicine that's this expensive. So, uh, and plus the whole, this a side note, but the whole way this medicine is priced is criminal. I, I will say that. Um, but anyway, this is what was going on in my life at the time. And I did a lot of artwork about the fact that I was sick because when you're sick, you think about yourself a lot and not in a conceited way. You just are thinking about that your back hurts, your leg hurts, you're exhausted, whatever it is. So if you're an artist, whether you're a writer or a painter or a singer, you're going to create about that. So that's what these were all about, being trapped in that space, trying to make these decisions, nothing from the outside world going on. So. Um, and then from those, this is sort of, I didn't know where to put these, but this is, these are based from those early ones. This is a mural at the Museum of, National Museum of Health and Medicine in Washington. She had seen some of the skeletal works and then asked me to come in and do a big mural in their lobby. And this is sort of a history of medicine thing that I did for UCLA for their Learning Resource Center. And it started out with, I'm trying to even remember, it was like healthy care, pediatrics, bad health decisions, good health decisions, something, something like that. It was a long time ago. But, but it, and then this, these are paintings about my parents. So a lot of my, my story, my paintings have stories attached. I always like having stories, and that sort of flows into the work that's in the other room. So this is my parents when they were getting along, and then my parents when they were not getting along on the one side. Um, and most of that change, I think, occurred because the financial strain, the emotional strain of having really sick kids. You know, it was, it was not easy for them to have two really sick kids. Um, I had my first hip replacements at 34, and you can see by the wire that's around my hip that they shattered the bone when they put in the new hip, so it took forever to heal and didn't actually heal right, which is why I had to have everything redone again when I was in my 40s. So these, but after the second set of hip replacements, there was no more pain. I was taking enzyme replacement, so I wasn't exhausted all the time. And all of a sudden, this is literally after coming out of the operating room, three or four weeks later, I did the first painting on the left. And it, it wasn't a conscious decision to change what my subject matter was. It just started changing. The color palette started changing. Even though there's not a lot of the outside world, it was starting to creep in these paintings. There were other people in the paintings. It's not just about me anymore. Um, there's cats. <laughs> there's sort of some sensuality. So without just the difference in how I felt changed my imagery. And then as I got healthier, the paintings became less and less about illness. They became more about sort of romance and just people interacting. The colors got brighter. Um, here's a whole series of sort of romantic, different views on romance paintings. Um, oh, that one wasn't supposed to be there anymore. It's in the other picture. But a French cafe, you're going to France. Um, and 
Then when I didn't really have anything to say about my illness anymore, I started doing these really frivolous paintings. And they sell, but at the same time, I really felt like I needed to be doing something that was more important than paintings with cats on people's heads. <laughs> but these sell really well. Um, so I would do these things just to kind of fill time, because I like to paint. But I was showing them at a gallery, and this woman rolled into the gallery. And this was before the Iraq War. And she it was in Beverly Hills, and she had on an evening gown with a very low back on it. And it was so shocking at the time to see somebody with that big a scar show up at an art opening and show off the scar, because we weren't used to seeing scars back then. And so we had a long talk. So what happened with her is she had been at a summer camp, and she had been on a zip line, and she slipped. She fell 23 feet, landed on a rock. And you can see right where her back broke. So, you know, it broke in, in two places. So I, I was talking to her that night about the cats and that I used to do work about being sick. And she, she got on my case. She was like, you need to keep doing work about mobility issues. You need to keep doing work about health issues. She called me a tab, which she said was temporarily able-bodied person. Uh, temp yeah, temporarily able-bodied a tab. And she just kept saying, all you people, you're going to all be in wheelchairs one day. You think you're so great walking around. <laughs> and uh, and she, was, she was right. So I called her up and said, could I try doing a print of your scar? Because I had done a class once on Japanese fish prints. I don't know if you guys know what those are, but in Japan, they they actually print fish. And I thought, if I could print that texture, maybe I could print a scar. So I printed her scar, and I put it up in a gallery. And people, the first time I showed it was her print and one other print, one of her friends who had had lung cancer, who has since died. But people kept walking up to me in the gallery and telling me about their scars. They were undressing. They were undoing their shirts and picking up skirts. and pulling down pants, and everybody wanted to tell me what they were going through. And af after time and sort of taking it in, it became really apparent to me that everybody w wanted to be acknowledged for their sort of long-term suffering. They wanted you to know what the, the stress was still in them emotionally, even though the doctors had said to them, your bone is fine, your new organ is working, your skin is knitted together there was an unfinished part. And, and you know, I always talk about everybody knows the day they got a heart transplant, but they're, who, not everybody, everyone who's had a heart transplant knows what day they had it, but there's not an actual day when the healing ends because it's such a long process. So these prints over time have sort of taken that job because I can do a print and somebody can put it on the wall and go, there it is. That's what I went through. I'm done with it. So it sort of gives people an actual ending that they can talk about. Like that, I had a s six years of healing. And some people come to me before they have operations and they arrange to do the print as soon as they're healed up. And a lot of people wait three or four years because they're not ready to talk about it yet. So anyway, this woman and the woman who told me I could draw in the hospital, they, they are the two most important people in my life. Um, so I'm going to just go through some of these people. Uh, this is a, a young woman in LA who's very funny. She's a comedian. And she goes up on stage. And of course, she has to acknowledge what's happened to her. She was in a car. The car flipped over, cut her arm off. Um, luckily, she was left-handed, so it didn't affect her as much as it would affect me. What's great with her on stage is when she's doing her comedy routine, she loves making quote marks like this because it makes <laughs> everybody laugh. Um, this is a guy. OK, so this is where it gets in. It's all about these stories. It's wanting to tell stories. So this is a guy who, when he was 19 years old, blew his hand off with fireworks. And he thought he was doing everything properly. He 
the fireworks went off. He was throwing sand on the ones that were there so they wouldn't explode. But apparently he put the shovel in. As soon as he picked up the sand, enough air got in and the last firework blew up and blew his hand off. And his family story is that his mom, back in Germany 40 or 50 years ago, had done something, her hand got mangled, and the, and the treatment of attaching your hand to your stomach while you figured out how to do the operation to save the hand, he claims was partially developed in Germany with his mom. And then 30 years later, 40 years later, the same thing happens and he has his hand attached to his body for several months while they figured out how to reconstruct his hand. So I don't know if any of this is true, but that's the story he tells when he doesn't tell people that he was bitten by a shark. So, <laughs> um, this is, so this is how I approach these scars now. I do the prints, which you can see them all in there. I roll the ink on the people, I pull the print, and before I do the print, I talk to people about what happened to them. So in this case, this woman was in a car accident. The car skidded out, went around the road, hit a telephone pole. So I try to take what happened to the people and put it into their scar. I want each one to be a narrative about what happened to them. So this woman also went, got married, went to Mexico. This is not the same thing. Her husband died on the honeymoon. I mean, she's just had so many bad things happen to her. And then she came up to the United States and sh right after that lands up doing this and then loses her spleen because, because of the car accident. So she's had a rough, a rough year. Um, I did a series for Breast Cancer Awareness Month a couple years ago. So these are all people with different sorts of breast cancer. And we did a show with the Cancer Society. And we had eight people, eight volunteers came to get printed. And what was interesting to me, maybe not so much to you doctors, everybody decided to deal with it in a different way. So the, the guy up on top, he had mastectomy, didn't do any sort of uh, reconstruction or tattooing or anything like that. What's interesting in his story is when he got cancer, he first thing he did was took the test to become a postal employee so he would have insurance. So that was his first thought, like if I'm going to do this, I need to have insurance. So he works for the post office now. Uh, the woman on top had a double mastectomy and reconstruction. and. You can't see it under the ink, but she has tattoos of flowers from Hawaii because she grew up in Hawaii over at the scar. The, the lower picture is out in the room here. Is a mother and daughter who both had cancer in the same breast at about the same age. And the bottom right is a woman who landed up having one breast removed. And now she runs a group called you only need one or something like that. And, and she's trying to get people to not worry about having reconstruction. So it was just interesting to me. We had, women, we had one woman who didn't do any reconstruction. We had, so it just, all, all seven of the people came in, decided to deal with it completely differently. And it was just random. And I had no idea that that's the way it was. I just assumed it's LA, everybody gets fake boobs anyway. And I just thought, Oh, they're all going to get reconstruction, but that's not what, what happened. So now these are veterans. I'm going to do a couple of veteran stories. And if you want to see a video about me printing this guy, you can take a picture and it'll, the QR code will go to that. Um, he was a, in Iraq. He, there was an explosion. He ended up having to have 43 operations. He came out of it blind for a while. They had to redo his eye socket. He had skin grafts here. If you look, uh, you can't see it too much right here, but all the, all the muscle was taken off of his bone. And in the video, he talks about how he would not trade this experience for anything because when he came back, which was earlier, met his wife, had his kid, 
you know, and now he's actually a very su successful photographer. He goes all around the world with different NBA players shooting them when they play in Europe and places like that. But he, an amazingly nice guy. Um, there's another guy who, another Iraqi guy with an amputation who goes out every year and plays spring training with different baseball teams to show that even with a disability or amputation, you can still play sports, you can still um, be an active, an active person. He just has a book out, I'm, I'm trying to remember the title, but his whole story. Um, this is probably the saddest of all of the, the vets. This guy, uh, when he was telling me his story, he, he and his best friend, he was not college material, his friend went to college, he didn't know what to do, so he enrolled in the army. And on his 19th birthday, he was stuck in a tank that got hit by, a missile came underneath it, or a projectile of some sort, I don't think missiles, right? Exploded, and he was stuck in the tank, and the tank was on fire. He couldn't get out because the turret on the tank here couldn't turn because it had been sort of tweaked. So while he's in there, his, you know, he's screaming, his arm is sort of burning. And when they finally got him out, he was paralyzed. He had had, you know, his back had been broken. But they kept trying to save his arm. He had several operations to try to save his arm enough so there would be something to anchor a prosthetic onto. And they finally weren't able to do it. He just kept getting gangrene. But I shot him with his daughter because when he came back, his ex-wife, tried to get the kids away from him, saying that he was not capable of being a good parent. And he fought for his kids, and he landed up getting full custody. So that's the only photo where I have somebody else in the picture. Um, this is a young woman who had a tumor inside her pelvis. And she kept going to the doctor, and they kept saying, you've got sciatica, Take, do yoga, treat it, stretch more, and it kept getting worse. So they took an x-ray, they didn't see anything, and her doctor tried to get the insurance company to okay an MRI. The insurance company would not do that for 123 days, so that's what those little calendars are up there. That's how long it took to get the MRI. And once they did, they saw this massive tumor in her pelvis. And she told me she went to 14 doctors who all said to her, "We." you're not operable, get your life in order. And she was only 18 or 17 at the time. But she met one doctor who she said was like Dr. House. He was not going to take no for an answer. And um, he, he said to her, I can save you, but I can't save your leg. If I take out the tumor, I have to take out part of your pelvis, but I can, I can build like a little sack so you won't fall over when you sit. So he landed up taking her pelvis, taking the leg. She was in the hospital. She met a kid in the hospital, went to the senior prom, high school with him, and then uh, afterwards sued the insurance company for $25 million and won. So they should have let her have her MRI. And I don't know whether or not it would have been treatable earlier, but she, you know, I'm not a doctor. Anyway, this was my cat, and my cat had no, no back feet when I found this cat because the cat had OCD, and it kept scratching its head, and the people who had it decided we are going to declaw the cat. And then the cat picked at the sutures, got infected, so they had to take the, the feet off. And I, I went to the vet because my cat was sick, and I saw this cat slip, slipping all over the place on linoleum. And the cat is in here because normally when I talk to med students and there's a big group of med students, they will look at the story of the woman who had the amputation and be completely silent. But then they look at the cat and everyone's like, oh, poor cat, poor cat. So the, my, my late cat Stella here is to make all these young doctors question their own empathy. Why can you feel empathy toward the animal? Why can you not feel it toward people? 
because I, especially working at the med school, I see the kids come in, they're really excited, and after about six weeks, everything is mundane to them, they don't really care anymore, and, and I always use the example that I remember the doctor that did my hip, who didn't do it right and smashed my leg up, but he wouldn't have any idea who I am if I walked up to him. And that, I mean, you guys are doctors, you know, you, you do something that might be very routine for you two, you do it all the time, but it's a once in a lifetime event for your patient. So the, the difference in the dynamic of a procedure from how you see it to how the doctor sees it is monumental. So that's what I try to get through with all this storytelling. Um, so now I'm at the Keck School of Medicine and I started a program there where I find artists whose artwork corresponds to the curriculum of the medical school. So if we're studying respiratory illness, um, I find somebody with cystic fibrosis or emphysema. If, they, if we're in the neurological section, I find someone with Parkinson's or MS. And they have to be artists that do, are already doing work about their illness. I don't want somebody with MS who's doing landscapes. I want them doing work about what it's like to have MS. Because I think a lot of times for those med students, it's easier to see the narrative of their patient's life through their artwork than them talking about it. So this is by Dominic, who's actually, if you guys are here tomorrow night, I'm gonna interview Dominic. Dominic has cystic fibrosis. He has had his lungs replaced. And he tends to do work in his hospital room of all the mundane things that he's seen his entire life because he has, like me, also been in the hospital all the time. And this is my favorite, of all the artwork by patients, this is my favorite piece. Because every hospital room I've ever been in from the time I was six years old until recently has this picture in it. And there's always flowers in it because hospitals, for some reason, do not have vases. They only have water pitchers. <laughs> so the flowers always land up in your water pitcher, and then you don't have a water pitcher. And if the stems on the flowers are too long, the water pitcher tips over. So whoever's here from the hospital, buy vases. <laughs> um, this is a woman who has MS. And she uses all her old medical supplies. I have a lot of artists that use their medical supplies in their art. And she does all this patterning because she says, since her MS, the only thing she can do is organize things and make patterns. She used to do paintings with patterns, but now she uses her medical supplies because she can't hold a paintbrush anymore. She's too weak. Um, this is another guy who had cystic fibrosis and he has had two lung transplants. The first one got rejected and then amazingly, somebody saw his artwork about his cystic fibrosis and said, my sister is dying, would you like her lungs? And they were a match. So he was down to 10% oxid oxidation, I don't know the exact word, transferring, and uh, this person just called him and said, do you want these lungs? And they were a perfect match. So he's seven years in now. But he started noticing that every time he had to go to the hospital, the ambulance had a different pattern depending on the company. So he started keeping track of all the ambulance patterns and doing these glitter paintings from them. So I, I just love this. The, like he had the sense to even think about that with an oxygen mask on him and everything. Uh, this is a woman who's a hairdresser. This is the only painting she's ever done, but she, she did this painting about the phone call when the doctor called her up to tell her she had breast cancer. And I just think it's an incredibly powerful painting. So the next few are before and after examples of artists who did one kind of work until they got sick and then they started doing another type of work. So on the left, this is a, a photographer in LA and she just did objects and she was very well known. She did, her name's Ellen Cantor. She does, this whole series taking kids' children's books vintage books and sort of slowly doing multiple exposures so you get the pictures from the book. And on the, the right side was a sculpture she did when 
she was talking to the doctor about she was having back pain and migraines. And when we showed this work, this was at UCLA, NPR came and did a story about this, you know, headache show. I can't remember if it was back pain or headache. And Ellen talked about that she didn't really understand what the doctors were saying to her. A lot of her artwork when she was sick was sort of making sense of the things the doctor said to her that she didn't completely understand. But they asked the pain specialist what he thought of this piece, and he said, well, proportionally, the brain is not the right size. That was his, he didn't look at this as depicting pain, he just thought the brain's not the right size. So that, again, that is the kind of stuff that I am fighting against. Uh, this is a woman who, I, and she had it before, Eldler, uh, her hand, the one where your hands get. Eldler, Donald, thank, thank you. you. I always, I can never remember that. It's like my brain. Anyway, she was doing sort of very average still lives before. She was an okay painter. But once she couldn't hold a brush anymore and she had to figure out another way to paint, she started using knives and palettes and doing this incredibly, you can't tell in these paintings, but they're about this thick because she just slams the painting down. But all this stuff on here, this is about her genetic coding and what's going on with her. So I think that her new work that she did after she became sick is, is way way better than uh, the stuff she did before. This is a woman who was doing sort of decorative seascapes, florals. These are sort of contact photo prints. And then she developed cancer, so she started doing work about all the medicine she was taking. Uh, this is a woman named Liz Atkin who lives in London. And she is a comp OCD, compulsive skin picker. And she, when I first met her, we were in a show together about skin. And I had the scars in, and she had work about skin picking. And then at a certain point, she realized, she started working with charcoal. And she realized that holding the charcoal in the same way that she would pick alleviated the OCD. And she started drawing more and more with charcoal. And now she's, she's, actually she's moved from London to the coast in England by the water and she does these absolutely amazing charcoal drawings of the ocean and it alleviates her OCD. She doesn't skin pick anymore just by holding the chalk in the same position. Um, this is, I just showed this guy at, at USC. He was a cartoonist. He worked on the Jetsons and the Flintstones and Yogi Bear. And you can kind of tell by his style. So the one on the left is how he was working before when, you know, it's sort of a dated sexist image, but I like it anyway. But the one on the right, he developed Parkinson's. And he had never, until he was in his 80s or until his 70s, done work about himself. He had always drawn the Flintstones. He literally had been there for 50 years since they first started. So he started doing these really complex drawings of what Parkinson's was to him. You know, monsters and things being attacked and all the thoughts that were going through his head. And to me, again, that's so much more interesting than these little sort of cartoony drawings he did for himself. And this is one, he did this the night before he went in to have deep brain stimulation for his Parkinson's. And this is sort of how he was imagining it. So what was interesting with him is he was right-handed. His right hand started shaking so much that he couldn't draw, so he learned to draw with his left hand. This was done with his left hand. And then once he had the deep brain stimulation, he could draw with his right hand again. Um, this is a woman who did, you know, this is sort of a Frida Kahlo knockoff on the left, but the one on the right was after she had breast cancer. She did some incredibly strong work about having breast cancer and having a mastectomy. So this is, this is what I'm doing at Keck now. So this is how all this stuff comes together. So this is a woman, um, Elizabeth Jameson, who has very late stage MS. She 
can't move anything except her mouth and her eyes, but she's still doing artwork. She takes her scans and she has somebody else colorize them. She tells them what to do. She works in partnership. She's, she's written some amazing editorials for the New York Times about what it's like to have MS. She, there was one published about two months ago in the power of cursing and how cursing helped her get through it. Um, so, and this is our format. We have the artist and the artist talks about their medical care and how doing art helps them. But I also have a medical specialist of that illness on stage first to, to give details to the med students. Um, but I also want to hear what the, the doctors say about the art and whether or not they think it, it portrays their image of what the lived experience is of the patient. So when I first started these talks, I just had the artist. And then I had, I had one artist in who did sort of amazing work about cancer, but she was also a total conspiracy theorist about this is making me sick and that, and the drug companies this and that, and I'm like, I better get a doctor on stage to moderate her. And so just because of that, the, the whole lecture series, it just got so much better having the counterweight, be, and, and not so much that the artist changed, but hearing the doctors talk about the art and their insight to it has been really pretty amazing. Um, this is a woman who had a very normal pregnancy, and then there was a catastrophe of some sort during childbirth, and her son is completely disabled. Can't speak, can't walk, nothing. And she uses all his medical supplies to do artwork. And I've shown her at Keck and a, a couple other places. So when she was on stage, I paired her with a social worker because I was so amazed that she could manage this. She's a single mom. She has another child. And I just had her go through her day. You know, not only when does she have time to do art, but her schedule, getting her kid up, getting him changed, getting him fed, changing his feeding tube, all the things she had to do, like seven hours a day is just getting him up and out before she can even do art or anything else. And I really wanted the med students to see, like you're dealing with a patient, but, but what's happening with this patient affects the entire family. So I, when I can, I try to get social workers on the stage too. Um, these are two different artists who had visual perceptual differences. The, the guy on the top, that's his artwork. He had had a stroke and he can't see out of one eye anymore and his brain is sort of like phantom limb but he's getting images. So he makes photos to show you what he sees when he looks at, at someone's portrait now. And then down below is a woman who has facial blindness. And what was so interesting with her is it wasn't, she didn't even know she had facial blindness. And one day we were talking about her photos and I said, you know, your photos are sort of interesting. You're always cutting off the heads or the people are blurry. And she's, I said, why don't you ever do faces? And she goes, well, you can't really see faces anyway. And, and she was already 53 and no one, she didn't know she had facial blindness. And I was like, you've got facial blindness. And she went home, Googled it wrote me and she's like, you're right, nobody ever picked up on this before. So it's sort of interesting. So what we had is we had an optometrist uh, on stage and while he is talking about his artwork and what kind of stroke he had had, she is doing visual testing on him and talking to the med students about this at the same time. So she is talking about the art, using the art as a, ref as a teaching tool and then examining him for all the med students to see at the same time. So that's kind of that magic stuff that happens sometimes. Uh, this is a woman who has Gaucher's disease also, and she somehow, after her hip replacement, managed to get a little piece of the bone, and she went to Caltech and put it inside an electron microscope, and now she does electron microscopy of bees, so she got First she wanted to see what her hip looked like through the microscope, but then she got so interested in the, the equipment that she has become this bee 
big bee expert and she goes all around the world showing these bee photos she does and talking about saving bees. So her illness sort of led to something completely in a different path because of her artwork. Um, this is another video. It's up there. This woman had gone into the hospital. She was getting a hysterectomy. They nicked her colon. She got a massive infection. They put her in a coma. When she woke up, her arms and legs had been removed from gangrene. And she is, you can see her smiling. She is like the happiest person, and I don't understand it. <laughs> I mean, I, I talk to her, and I'm, I'm atheist, and I, every once in a while I'll meet someone like her who is very religious, who is, finds this comfort in God wanted this to happen, I'm an activist for, you know, uh, support animals now, and she's very happy. And when I was talking to her, she was saying that her whole body, her skin is all burned from the infection that she had and the gangrene, and, but it stopped right here. And she's like, well, God stopped it there so that I would look good when I'm on stage. And it's just, it's a completely different outlook than I would have, and I would be cursing, if I believed in God, I would be cursing God. But she is like, oh, he did me a favor, he stopped it right there. So I just, I just find the whole, how everybody deals with all this stuff amazing. Uh, this is Dominic, who is gonna be here tomorrow night, and the last time Dominic went in to get his lungs all cleared out, this was before he had his lung transplant, um, I went to his hospital room to take pictures and have him talk about all those pictures and Sharps containers and things that he painted over the years. And so I went and just interviewed him in the hospital. And this is a woman named Kathy Allen who lives up in the high desert in California who was had cancer three months out from when she died and she wanted to talk about her artwork and what she was doing setting how to you know her artistic legacy and what it was like to have cancer and I had when I first heard she had cancer I called her up and said you want to talk about what kind of art you're doing and what it's like to do art knowing that you're going to probably die before you get another show she didn't want to do it, but she called me up three months before she died. She's like, I want to have a record. So um, this, this whole thing of telling people stories has, has led to things like this. And so many people in the high desert, she was teaching at the college there, come up to me and like, we're so happy you got to interview Kathy before she died, you know, about her artwork. And this is what I'm doing now. So I am not doing artwork about me or illness. I'm just doing sort of happy, shagali looking desert scenes. And then I'll get back to uh, my family. So my brother, who had Gauchets, he landed up getting Parkinson's. Uh, people with Gauchets, I always get it wrong, are 16 times more likely to get Parkinson's than the general public percentage-wise. Um, so Richard, even though he got on the same drug, he landed up developing Parkinson's. Um, and this is him. You can see his face is starting to look expressionless. Those, those are my two cats, Stephen and Stephen. Um, and then this is Richard. He was a musician. And this is him in the nursing home uh, a number of years later. And he really it was very difficult because he lost his ability to speak and to have somebody who was on stage and writing music and singing not be able to to sing it was really really hard and it's you know i don't i'm part of a study at nih to follow me and figure out why siblings are not getting it if it's genetic and so far luckily there is no correspondence between siblings having a higher percentage, so maybe I will miss all this. But anyway, it's, it's, I, I'm always grateful that I didn't get it, but I feel bad he really got screwed by life. So this is me dumping his ashes. And my other brother, Doug, the one who was so healthy, he landed up just getting diabetes. He was enormous by the time he died. He had terrible eating habits. He didn't exercise. So he, he died of uh, 
of diabetes. So, um, so of the family, my mom got lung cancer, Richard died of Parkinson's, and Doug died of, of diabetes. And when I was growing up, I was always told, you are not going to make it to 30. So it just shows the doctors are not always right. I was lucky enough to make it until the enzyme replacement was invented. And now I'm actually on a pill. I take a pill every day that, so I don't, I had, I had 18 years of IV every two weeks and now I'm on, I'm on a pill. But you just never know what's gonna happen. So the doctors were not correct and I outsmarted them all. Um, and this is my website if you wanna look and see all the videos I do there and other people's artwork and other stuff I've done and that is it. Any questions? Oh. oh, that's what I was just going to say. Ted, we'll be happy to answer some questions, or um, if you have any, it would be wonderful to take the time to ask. Yes. It's really amazing work. I'm really impressed. Oh, thanks. And, uh, it's a good point of being actually inspirational in a lot of different areas. How much do you see other medical schools doing this across the country? I am trying. <laughs> well, it's like I know NYU has an artist in residence, but her interest, she has very bad scoliosis. Her interest is drawing bodies, so she does life drawing with them. Uh, I know that I think it was, uh, oh God, there's, there's a few other schools. The one in La Jolla has an artist in residence, but she got in there mostly so she could do her own work about medicine. Um, Cleveland Clinic has an art department. But so I think it's being in more and more, but it's, I'm really focused on the med schools and I am not seeing a huge amount. They're all starting to have to bring in some medical humanities, but as far as I can tell, we're the only one that has it directly tied to the curriculum. University of Florida has a huge and the Mayo Clinic, they both have pretty big art departments. Florida especially, they, they're doing projects all the time. But USC, I was very lucky because the, the woman who I work for who runs, she used to be the curriculum dean. Um, she is also a PhD English lit professor um, or English lit doctor. So she is all about making the kids read books and see movies about medical conditions and empathy and storytelling. So when I met her, it was like just she totally got what I was doing and I totally got what she was doing. So I was very lucky. But I would like, to, and we're talking about it here already, I would like to take all these shows that I do at Keck, pack them up and send them over here and put them up on the wall and maybe bring the artist out here and interview them you know, in front of all your students. Because it's a shame to just do them once. They're kind of monumental shows. And a lot of these artists, they don't have anywhere else to show this work. People don't want work about a heart transplant or you know, kidney dialysis or something. It's not stuff you normally put over your couch. So, yeah. I haven't, because I'm not an art therapist. I don't have a degree, so I don't even pretend that I know what I'm doing other than just telling my story. And I think because of all my years in the hospital, I have a lot of comfort. I don't even know if I'm more empathetic, but I, I'm very comfortable talking to people about their illness. So it's not hard for me to get somebody on stage and ask them questions. And I don't try to get people to do art about it. I find work that already exists artists that are already telling their story and just saying, I'll give you a bigger venue for it, 
and why don't you tell your story to these med students so they see you're a human and not a chart. Well, you know, I'm sure some of the different schools do that. One of the things they do at Keck every year is, you know, that secrets project with the postcards. Do you guys do that? So they've done that a couple years at Keck, and it's sort of amazing. Do you guys all know what this is? They send, they get postcards, they write a secret on it, and they mail it in, and they'll put them up on the wall in the med school. And it's amazing how many of the kids write, I don't know if this is a career I want, I don't know if I'm smart enough for this. I don't, I'm doing this for my parents. You know, and so they, just, they really tell their secrets. They're not signed. They're just mailed in, or there's a box for them. And it's kind of you, you know, the, the imposter syndrome for a lot of the med students is pretty prevalent. I was, I was really surprised. You know, some of them were things like, oh, I slept with my roommate's boyfriend. You know, that was their, <laughs> or, or I just love being here. And so, you know, but a lot of them were people really doubting whether they made the right choice. I was really surprised. So, anything else? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Some of the people, I've been really, I was just saying to her, some, I've been really lucky. Some of the people I've gotten to interview for different projects, like the former head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I interviewed about six months ago because he landed up getting aphasia. And to see a guy who used to get up in front of Congress and, and lost his complete ability to speak and had to relearn it all, so I got to talk. So I've spoken to people like that. There's a an architect I talked to who lost his eyesight, and now he works uh, making buildings for the visually impaired. Like he'll change textures on the floor and put grooves in them so people can get around and things. So he, he changing wall patterns and textures so the sound is different from room to room. He thinks of things that we wouldn't think of. Um, so I've gotten to interview some really amazing people like that. that um, and they all have, you know, interesting stories, how they've dealt with them. It's, what's amazing to me is, you know, I, I look at the woman without the arms and legs, and I don't know if I would want to live in that condition. She's very happy with it. And the, the number of people that I have interviewed that are like, oh, in a way, this is the best thing that happened to me. You know, I, I don't know. I think it's just coming to terms with it. Hopefully your sister will, too. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks. So thanks so much for joining us this evening. I really appreciate it. Have some pizza. <laughs> <laughs>